Today, Mexico's murder rate is even worse than the last time you checked. Not great publicity for the tourist trade. And it was the same way 10 years ago. And looking back on the invasion of Panama 29 years ago tonight, I'm Chuck Holton, and this is The Hot Zone. This is The Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Thanks for joining us. An American tourist named Tatiana Miratenko, a beautiful 27-year-old newlywed, was out celebrating her first wedding anniversary with her husband and a few friends last Saturday night in an upscale part of Mexico City. As they were leaving the restaurant, two men rode up on a motorcycle and opened fire at the bouncer standing at the door. The young American woman was caught by a stray bullet, tragically ending her life. It's a horrific story. We hear about the rising crime rate in Mexico now reaching record levels with nearly 30,000 murders and assassinations happening, happening there every year. Once booming tourist destinations like Acapulco and Cancun are now becoming virtual ghost towns as cartels engage in gory turf wars. And in far too many cases, innocents are being caught in the crossfire. But still, should you be worried? Today, there are more than a million American citizens living in Mexico mostly retirees who have moved south for the warmer climate and lower cost of living. It's really amazing considering that violence like we are seeing today has really been going on for decades. In fact, let me show you a piece I made about this issue 10 years ago that could literally have been filmed this week. Fighting between rival drug cartels has led to thousands of deaths across Mexico in recent months. The border city of Juarez has been virtually ruled by masked criminals who have robbed and murdered at will. Just across from El Paso, Texas, this industrial city has seen almost 2,000 murders in the past year alone. City officials have been forced to resign or literally run for their lives. The U.S. Congress has even debated sending troops to the region as the bloody crime wave threatens to spill across the border. Mexican President Felipe Calderón has initiated what amounts to martial law in many parts of the country in order to quell the violence. In Juarez, more than 5,000 Mexican soldiers are patrolling the streets, along with hundreds of federal police. We're here on the edge of the city. It's a convoy of military police come in from Chihuahua. They've sent over 1,000 extra troops with dogs and armed to the teeth to put a stop to the rest of the violence. This show of force seems to be having its desired effect. I visited the General Hospital in Juarez to talk with emergency room doctors who literally have their fingers on the pulse of the city. We measured the, the cases that we had from January 2008 to August, and we have more than 300 cases injured, not killed. Many days, more than one a day. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but so far this year? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It's, uh, this year is improving. One of the biggest concerns is that the violence will creep north into the U.S. Last week, Congress made it clear U.S. troops would be sent to the border if needed. But according to the Border Patrol, increased vigilance is keeping the peace in the El Paso sector. We really haven't seen the violence spill over. Um, now, at the ports of entry, we have seen where individuals that have been shot in Mexico or in Juarez have been transported to the ports and then from there taken to the local hospital here in the U.S. In the last few years, what we have seen is an increase in violence against some of our agents. Uh, the reason being is, as we're becoming more successful in controlling our borders and, and gaining control of what's going on, uh, the smugglers are becoming more desperate. But Roberto Hernandez, the consul general at the Mexican consulate in El Paso, points out the need for cooperation on both sides of the border. It's not uh, just a matter how many cartels we do have in Mexico. It's not a matter how many users you have in the United States, millions maybe. It's a matter of shared responsibility to fight against the organized crime. And in fact, it's a global responsibility. We are committed to do that. With a State Department warning against travel to Mexico, the normally lucrative spring break is turning out to be a flop this year. But some say the government and tourists are using the border violence to paint this country with too broad a brush. 
Steve Calvert came to Mexico eight years ago to start a sport fishing business. You can't judge the United States by what happens in Los Angeles at 2 o'clock in the morning, so you, you certainly shouldn't judge Mexico on what happens in Juarez. San Carlos is a resort area north of Mazatlan, and it's normally booked solid this time of year. Now, its beaches and businesses are almost empty. And that's adding to an already hurting economy. You know, uh, Catch-22 sport fishing, we're probably off about 50% off the mark this year. Uh, and I think that the, uh, the economy in the states is a big factor. Uh, we have a, a joke down here that everybody's 401k just turned into a 201k, now it's a 101k. <laughs> You know, things got so bad in Juarez that they had to close the airport because of the violence back a few weeks ago. But now with all the troops that have come in, violence is way down, things are a lot better. And the people of Juarez are very thankful for it. Constant media coverage of the violence, however, paints an image that's hard to overcome. Terry Bilderback heads up the missions outreach for the First Baptist Church of El Paso. Historically, we have had groups that have been willing to come and be involved in missions from around the United States. We have seen a reduction in the number of folks that are willing to come here and cross the border. In addition, First Baptist has ended up curtailing the mission activities that we are involved in in Mexico. The push for peace and divine intervention, however, is strong. Last week, members from over 800 churches in Juarez held a seven-day prayer vigil outside the municipal center, begging God to bring peace to the city. Yes, we come in here to pray every day, 24 hours a day. Last night we have like uh, about 300, 350, but uh, when we finish, I know we're going to have at least about 1,500 people. We love this city. They're also hoping that missions groups won't stay away for long. We're praying to God for them to come this year because it's a blessing to, uh, for them to come here. The administration of President Calderon is committed to fight against the organized crime. The, the government is in control of the situation. Of course, we are facing a lot of different kinds of problems, but in the meantime, we are going to continue the fight until we succeed. At this point, nobody can say whether or not this Mexican surge will stop the violence for good. And the United States government is keeping a wary eye on the border. For now, these Christian men and women are praying that the fragile peace will hold. Chuck Holton, CBN News, Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Well, if you're planning a trip south of the border, here's a few things you need to understand about violence in Mexico. Now, this holds true for most hot zones around the world, too. Number one, the majority of violence is drug-related. Most killings are between rival narco traffickers. And, you know, if you stay w away from them and the places they congregate, you're probably OK. As my friend John Correa likes to say, remember the rules of stupid. Don't go stupid places with stupid people at stupid times and do stupid things. You can probably get away with breaking one aspect of those rules, but two or more and you start to put yourself in danger. The violence is typically com compartmentalized into a few bad areas with the, within the country. In Mexico, if you stay away from the border areas and places like Acapulco and Cancun, you'll probably find Mexico to be fairly safe. I took my family to live in Sonora State one winter, and it was really peaceful. My kids ran all over town on, on their own. We heard that the area we were in was kind of declared off limits by the cartels, and that's why. Next, we can see with the story of this American woman killed on Saturday that whether you're in Mazatlan or Memphis, stuff just happens no matter how careful you are. So for that reason, you should always be prepared wherever you go. Carrying a tourniquet, for example, might be a small inconvenience for you, but it could literally save a life. And lastly, when it's your time, it's your time. Make sure you've said what needs to be said to your loved ones and that you're spiritually prepared for the end of your life. Because just like that unfortunate young lady, Tatiana Miratenko, you never know when your day's coming. Make sure you've committed your life to Jesus. That's got benefits both right now and after your day comes and they put you in the ground. Okay, let's move on to Panama, where I happen to be located right now. In 1989, this country was ruled by a dictator, Manuel Noriega. He'd been in power since 1983 and was known for unspeakable cruelty toward his rivals. He was the quintessential tin pot dictator. He was as corrupt as the day is long and everybody knew it. 
But that didn't stop the CIA from using him as an asset in the war on drugs. In fact, he'd been working covertly for the CIA since the 1950s. But Noriega was playing both sides of the fence, amassing a huge personal fortune through illicit drug and weapon sales. So in 1988, he was indicted by federal grand juries in Miami and Tampa on judges, uh, charges of racketeering, drug smuggling, and money laundering. And then President George H.W. Bush decided he had to go. I was a young ranger at the time, a specialist in the 3rd Ranger Battalion at Fort Benning, Georgia. And I had just successfully graduated ranger school and had been given the position of team leader in my squad. We'd been briefed on the deteriorating relations between the U.S. and Panama, which was significant considering the United States had tens of thousands of troops stationed there already to protect the Panama Canal. I myself had already deployed twice to Panama to attend the Jungle Warfare Training School at Fort Sherman, and so we were already very familiar with the country. So on December 17, 1989, which was a Sunday, I went by my barracks to pack some clothes for Christmas leave. We were preparing to go. Instead, we got locked, locked down and couldn't communicate with the outside world. Two days later, on December 19th, we were loading C-130s and C-141s with our kit loaded down for, with live ammo and headed to Panama. It was actually about one in the morning when we jumped, which means technically it was December 20th. But I remember when the jump masters opened the doors of the aircraft six minutes out and the rush of tropical humidity that flooded into the bird. We recited the Ranger Creed, shouting over the roar of the aircraft engines, and then stood up, hooked up, and shuffled to the door. One minute out, we passed a tiny island just offshore from the airfield at Rio Hato. There was a flash that we later heard was from two 500-pound bombs dropped by American F-117 stealth bombers, the first time those planes were ever used in combat. And just seconds later, the green light came on, and Rangers started stepping out into the night sky over Rio Hato the first American airborne combat mass tactical parachute jump since Grenada in 1983 when I was in sixth grade. I lost a good friend that night. Philip Scott Lear had been my ranger buddy in ranger school just months before. I sat next to him on the plane and shook his hand before we jumped. He was shot in the neck and killed not longer after he hit the ground. Now that's the kind of experience that shapes a man. It changes him. I have to say I aged that night. It's an experience I'd never want to repeat. But we did a lot of good for the Panamanian people by, and for America as well by taking out that evil drug kingpin turned dictator. My buddies who were there still get in touch every year on this day to remember what we did there as young men so many years ago. I always take a moment and remember my buddy Lear. It helps me avoid taking my life for granted, remembering his sacrifice. See, Lear didn't get to get married, to have a family, to see his children grow up. And whatever problems I have, Lear still reminds me that I have so much to be thankful for. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for being with me. Are you enjoying this podcast? If so, I ask you to consider buying me a, a cup of coffee by becoming a subscriber. It's only $3 a month on my Patreon page, and you'll get some perks too, like free copies of my books and more. Just go to patreon.com slash hotzone. You can also help for free by liking and sharing this podcast with your friends. I'm having fun making it. I hope you're enjoying it too. So have a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow on The Hot Zone. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.